The sun comes up and the sun goes down. Work away. Grab a little shot, I can do it all again. The sun comes up and the sun goes down. Work away. What you see here is the base bar flying over the X bar. This is part of base making. That's my boss. He lives in that cradle most of the time and oversees what I do most nights. I thought I'd leave it in there. This is the door that's in the, in the guitar, which is cedar and uh, I guess it's pocket wood and ebony. And that door allows you to close or open the sound hole so that you can tune the instrument for a specific room or a specific environment. And I'll show you that on the physical instrument. This is, yeah, I can run. I don't want to take all. Yeah, I can, I can let it run. This door, when it's finished, it'll have three springs pushing this ebony up against the inside of this port, sound port here. So it'll always make contact. Those springs are not in there yet, but the door is in there now. And so we can illustrate the, that. The, the door is positional over the hole? Yeah, you can move the door in and out. Okay. And that way you can tune the instrument to the room. And then what's holding the door open if there's springs on it? Uh, it's a... It, they're locks? No, we don't, it's friction, just friction, just because friction. The, the, the springs are keeping the door pushed up against the sound hole. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's enough friction there that you can just adjust it to where you like, and it won't rattle. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Could you stop that? This is the door in a halfway open position, you can see. Mm -hmm. This is where it's not finished. Or it's almost finished, but uh, could you go back? Is that possible, one? This is really fascinating. I love this. This is, you know, it's not how I thickness tops, but people ask, you know, what makes arch top guitars? you know, really uh, great. Well, you have to graduate the tops. So we'll carve the top to maybe a uniform quarter of an inch, and then I'll get in there and I'll graduate it from, um, I'll graduate that top from, say, uh, maybe 180 thousandths, maybe 100, and it'll come up, come up here, 180 thousandths to maybe in the center to maybe 130 around the rim, something like that. And how precisely you do that makes a huge difference in the way a top, that's the great thing about building these things. Here's that bass bar flying over the X-brace. This is from double basses. Ah, you see the light coming through? That's a 100 watt light bulb on the other side of the carved top. And so you, you get to see literally right through the spruce what, how thick it is. And this is a, I don't use this to tell me that it's 80 thousandths here. I use it to indicate an overall trend because you know, you'd be, wood is of course driving all of us crazy for our whole lives. So you never know what it's going to really do, but it is a pretty good indicator of just how thin these guys are. And this is, you would think this is paper thin, but it's really about 175 or 80 thousandths here and maybe 150 thousandths here. That's pretty substantial, you know? When you carve the top and the bottom, much like Laura did with his mandolins, do you get the same frequency on the top as you do the bottom? No. You do not? About a half a step difference. About a half a step. Yeah, you because know, you... That e is that equivalent to a particular note? Uh, well, it is dictated by the size of the instrument, and when you really think about it, people always ask me questions about tap tuning, and almost none of us really tap tune guitars. We try to bring them, get them to perform, but the shape of the instrument, the sound port, and the air mass determines what the resonant frequency is going to be, so it's, it's, you're fooling yourself if you think you can change that by thinning it, but what you can do is you can activate some areas, and uh, there's some places in the slide chart like where I have uh, dust on the top and you can see where the nodal points are in the instrument because this is brand new stuff to take the bass bar in a, in a bass guitar or a bass, big bass stand up fiddle or a violin or any of the violin family instruments the only bracing is the one bar running down the center here with guitars you have this X brace mostly that, that crosses the whole deal uh, to take these two and put them together was my object with this instrument and this I'm really glad that we were this is another part of the patented process here because I don't think it's ever been done before if, once that's been done it opens the door to a new family of instruments that take from the violin family and the guitar family. And they're very different the way they work. With a violin, you have a bow that's constantly putting energy into the instrument. But with a guitar, you have a plunk, and that's how much energy you have, and then it's gone. So guitars are energy conversion machines. They're, they're uh, devices which turn one type of kinetic energy into something we can hear through a, th a series of three oscillators, the strings, the bridge, and the top. 
And um, what I try to do is build instruments. My paradigm and my model is the most energy efficient thing I can build. So I'm always interested in, in uh, maximizing, and this is where Michael Kasha, the great physicist, influenced me. You asked him about the bridge design. Uh, he said that guitars are energy conversion machines. And he spoke deeply to me, although I never fire out everything he said, because there's one thing I've learned as a, an artist my whole life, or artisan, whatever we are, is that there's no great science without great art. There's no great art without great science, you know. But when it comes to after 43 years of doing this and teaching myself to become a better intuitional physicist, and you know, great musicians uh, do this, you know, they learn uh, to. I've watched you suffer on some days because he's like an antenna, you know, he, he picks up the cosmos. If it's a tough day out there, he'll know it. And you, to me, if you're an artist, what you do is you, you train yourself to make the best decisions. So, I will never let science trump art if I can't make a decision. It'll always be art that trumps the science at that final point of choice because why did I spend 43 years doing this every day and ruining my hands and losing families and all of that? Because that's what I'm here to do. So to me, I encourage my students and I teach quite a bit who come here to, you know, to, to really understand that, that, that you're here for a reason. You're not here to be an automaton. You're here to, you can become better as an intuitionist. You can become, you can teach yourself to be more sensitive, you know, this is what we do. To me, this is, I'm very fond of telling new people who come to start with me, I say, it's like Pi May in Kill Bill too. If you start here and you want to be a great guitar maker, I'll try to get you there. But, you know, I could just as easily pluck out your eye and, and, and kill you, as Bill says to Pi May before she goes up the mountain. The point being, if you really want to learn how to do this, I don't know how to not do it without 125%. So I push the people who work for me, I make them do things that, you know, they probably wouldn't want to do normally. Um, I want to make them do stuff that makes, puts them on the spot because, and I want them to do it with more, uh, I want them to exceed themselves every single day. And that's a big thing to ask anybody. I can hit the button if you want, I'll continue, I'm just rambling here. But to me, it's a very deeply felt business to be in, uh, to create these things. And uh, it's, 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 for me, it's just very important. That must be the music from the presentation. So this is the door halfway open. You could say I still have pencil lines on it because I was working on it that night. I hadn't figured out how to do it yet. And uh, this, this ebony rosette here is actually a turned piece of ebony. We actually, we actually make it with a router and a travel point, but it's a separate unit. Plugs into the instrument and ties into these braces so it becomes an exo brace. Actually becomes a part of the bracing on the outside. Where these intersect is the difference between guitars and basses and other violin family instruments. And so um, this is how I achieve that by scooping out the braces that have been pre-fit to the top, which is a complex process. It takes about a day to fit these braces to every curving difference of the top. And they, they look like this when you look down them. But it determines the, this is what, this is dust dancing on there from excitation. I'm exciting it with a, I forget what the frequency was, but you can see how it's forming patterns out here. And this, you can do this with any plate, but this is, this is what's called a go-bar deck. We're gluing the, uh, the, the back on the, the top on the instrument now. And, and this is a, uh, just a big sort of press that I have and with a big hand screw up here. And we just glue it down. We put a, put a foam rubber piece under the, one of these cradles, turn it over and just crank it and push it down onto the thing. Here we're cutting the binding slots. This, in, this, in this case, it was very complicated. I, have to, I had to modify my binding machine, which is this guy. I'm going to kill this for a second because this is interesting. Years and years ago, I designed this to, to work on guitars when I was in my 20s, and now it's a standard in most guitar shops, uh, this particular tool sold by Luthiers Mercantile and many others. However, it relies on drawer slides. We all have seen lots of drawer slides. <laughs> I saw my share of them. I still see them, uh, drawer slides. 90 degree motion up and down, holds a Porter Cable router has a bearing with a uh, bearing of cutting with a bearing on with a helical cutter. And because this particular machine, normally this other stuff down here isn't part of this jig, but in order to make this one follow the, the unique architecture, I had a, I put another bearing down here, tied it into this, you know, used a quarter inch shaft to make sure the location was dead nuts on, and then built the thing so that we could push this up and it would follow the unique weirdnesses of the sides and still index off of the top. It uh, has to index off of the only, the very last section of the top because once it starts moving in and starts doing this, it's going to distort it. So it's a, this was a real challenge. It took me a week to figure out how to do this, uh, but we got it done. And it was more complex to bind this instrument because, the, uh, because of those curves and, and uh, weirdnesses and the, the lack of straight geometry. But I think the result was really worth the effort.
I just converted this back today to cut the binding ledges on this guitar. So um, it was, this is the kind of stuff I don't get to do anymore much. It was really fun. I'm not a jig maker. That guy back there is a, is a brilliant jig maker. He takes my jigs and makes them much better than I would make them. Mike does. But, you know, anyway, that's, this is, like a lot of people use this. I think there's even one in the Martin uh, custom shop now. And by the way, if you design stuff for the industry, there's no money in it. <clears throat> so I get a great deal from Luthier's Mercantile and a bit of a discount. <laughs> I get an open, that's what I get for letting them sell my, my binding machine. <laughs> this is a, a double rabbit, one for the purfling, which is the interior material, and the other is the koa outside binding. What you're hearing is some artists performing on some instruments that I made. You can't hear the bass, which is, that's Bobby. But it sounds like a guitar, doesn't it? He's got no bass speakers. <laughs> um, this is from his album Down the Road, a CD. Anyway, you can see the binding ledges here, a little fuzz from the myrtle. But this is after the binding has been glued in. We, we cyanoalacrylate the binding in, in this case, crazy glue it in. And here, a little water on the myrtle to just bring out the beautiful color of the material. I love koa as a binding material because it has every color of the rainbow in it. If you take a jeweler's loop and you look at koa, it's got greens and reds and blues. and it's, it's an inc Most koa is multicolored. And so it's like accessorizing with material. It goes with almost anything if you use it well, although it's gotten very hard to get. These are a spool clamps that I glue the back on with, uh, and uh, these are very inexpensive to make out of gutter spikes. Oh, wow. A wonderful uh, uh, old guy gave me these clamps about 20 years ago and said, you know, carry on, I made these. I'll show anybody how to make these things. They're inexpensive, and I have a box full of them. They've lasted me so far. These are the same clamps he gave me 20 years ago. And he said, you know, the world needs these, and uh, I got fired from Luthier's Mercantile the next day. <laughs> so I never was able to introduce them, <laughs> but I use them. And um, this, those tapes mark where the bridge goes. There's the sound door that's been pierced out, or the access door, which I actually cut a hole in today. Uh, you look at the real instrument, you'll see that. This is what the box looks, uh, looks like, assembled but not bound. And you can see it looks like a ship. And I love this aspect of this. This is so unusual that... It just created so many uh, cool challenges, and it's what we did. And we have more. Why did you use myrtle? I'm sorry? Why did you use myrtle? Because myrtle's a great sounding material. Mm -hmm. And you know, myrtle's kind of like a cross between maple and rosewood. It's local, it's indigenous, and I love this material. It's, it's, it, it sounds, materials sound kind of dry or wet to me. This material sounds right in the middle. It, it, it's, it's what we call if you uh, stop that for a second, I can talk about this. It's kind of like, thank you. If you take a Super Bowl, you drop a Super Bowl, and it comes right back up to your hand. It's a material that doesn't have a lot of internal damping. So uh, like an ebony or a rosewood or uh, a Pernambuco, the ultimate non-damping wood, you know, it's like a Super Bowl in terms of the way it deals with energy. You drop the ball, it comes right back up to your hand. But with maple, for example, and one of the reasons it's used in archtop guitars is it sucks up a lot of energy, and so it's like dropping a spalding, and then the ball will only come back up halfway. So the materials are chosen primarily for their damping material question, qualities, and it's a good question you ask. So I'm going to really answer it. The, this material for an instrument like this, I needed to have a lot of overtones in the in the notes, uh, and you get a lot of the overtones and quality of uh, a note is a sum of a lot of notes you don't hear. It's a sum total of uh, overtones and and of uh, harmonics, and what you hear, when you hear a note and you would define that as pitch or timbre rather. It's because you're hearing all of those uh, overtones at once, and together they create like all the light. Like light is all the different colors, but you see clear light. Same thing with music. You know, any any note that gets created is a sum of a lot of other notes within it, but you never hear those. So, the, the ability of certain materials to propagate those frequencies is really why I choose them. And in the case of a bass, some other great bass makers have used, and Bobby showed me a bass that he had from another great maker, a guy named Tobias, who I was really a fan of. And he's the one who opened my eyes to, pe to Myrtle, and then I fell in love with it. Now I, I can't get enough of it big enough and flamed that it hasn't been powder posted, you know, because powder post mm -hmm. beetles love Myrtle. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I have some of it, so uh, this is a good choice for this instrument, I think. Anyway, rabbit, you can see the rabbit, you can roll that thing, and if you have questions, you can interrupt me. So as you're going down the, the process of building an instrument, the Cut it to this somewhat sequentially. I've got the door taped in place here, just to hold it. Because Typically, what's the time from, you know, from your first loft to finish? Um, in terms of, if I really want to build an instrument, I can build it in about 50 or 60 hours. This one's like 100, 
probably in 30 or 40, and, and there's design time and all of that, so the process is, what we're seeing here is probably about a two and a half, three month process, because I was making decisions and trying to figure out how I was gonna do things. But a normal guitar, I build in a class in a week, it takes four weeks to finish it after that, you know, and because uh, I'm still using lacquers. There's the beautiful water thrown on it just to see the Myrtle, what it's gonna look like, to give me the capacity to continue, the desire to continue. And then do you find that, you, well, I mean, it's, you know, what I know about quality instruments is that once you put a finish, the tone starts to change on it. So um, you've been using a lot of lacquer, you find? Well, because lacquer, um, in the violin world, they'd say, this is the interior once again. I'm really going to try and build this performance center. You can see the light coming through the top just from these lights here. That's a beautiful thing to me. I don't know why. This is the neck, and uh, that's about 50% of the guitar. Um, Will that have an adjustable truss rod? Or a yeah, this has a two-way adjustable truss rod, so it goes back or forward. And I'll answer your question, because I just let it fall off the table there. Um, this is the neck with the rabbits cut around for the binding. Ebony head plate veneer, about a tenth of an inch thick. These laminates are really designed, uh, came out of guitar making long before me. They really stiffen that uh, neck, keep it from moving, because for me it's energy loss when it's moving like that. And I got an interesting story about that. Want to stop that for a second, just so I can tell that story? The um, people see the Alembic bases and they think, well, the Alembic bases are, had the, that laminated back 30 years ago, and it's true. Uh, and I think they were the guys who really brought it to the industry in a big way. But, you know, I was reading a, a Lester uh, Flat Earl Scruggs banjo book uh, from 1938 where I found the same technology, and that's where I got it from as a young maker, uh, because he was talking about how they fixed banjo necks. And you would fix a banjo neck, which was so small, by doing these laminates of wood on it. And I have a pretty good idea that uh, somebody probably saw that. Uh, wherever that came from, I adopted it as a very young guy because I felt like headstocks. I was influenced heavily by Alembic, who was the company, who was uh, you know, the big company around me. And so I used that for my headstocks and never changed that multiple lamination thing. I've always used it, and I love the way it looks. And I can stand on the necks after I make them, which I'm fond of doing in the classes. They have carbon fiber reinforcing them. So I'll take a neck like that and I'll stand on it and do this and people go, oh my God. But you really can do that. And to me, that means that you're not wasting energy from that neck, you know, this is the thing. Gluing the fingerboard on, it, everything has to be dead nuts flat and within a thousandth of an inch, a thousandth of an inch is a problem. And so um, this call is, uh, you know, you can see it's fin birch. On the back of it, there's a, uh, a big steel bar, 20 pound steel bar. I have another one uh, that I use which has a big piece of carbon fiber on the back so and these two pieces, these, there is a couple of um, pieces of fiberglass rod here that push down the outside sections of the fingerboard so pushing a fingerboard down and having it remain accurate and locked in. I don't use waterborne adhesives for this, I use fish glue because introducing water into the system will create swelling and contracting, temperamental stuff and you also have to be able to take fingerboards off easily because as a maintenance thing, you know, there are some things with the guitars, they're tools, and so they're like cars. People will wear out things, and things will have to be done over their lifetime. There are very few original uh, Stradivari that have anything original in them. Some, some original stuff, but the bracing has almost all been replaced, you know. So when you build something like this, you always have to think, long after I'm gone, some poor idiot will be working on this thing. The last one of the instruments I built recently, I put a time capsule in the neck, and in the neck, I put my current views on Luthery in there and I said I'm not at liberty to tell anybody, tell, say anything about who, who I listed in here as great makers of the day. So people kept calling me and saying, am I in there? And I kept saying, oh, I can't say, you know. But the one thing I will reveal is at the end of this, because my vision is in 200 years, some poor schmucks, and I got, I understood after, somebody gave me a book on Stradivarius uh, to cheer me up. I was in a kind of a state of depression and a rut. And I read the book and I got more depressed and I got happier. But what I understood was that we all have a place in the cosmos. First I felt like a fool and I thought, okay. But instrument makers' lives from the 1600s have not changed much from instrument makers' lives today. You know, uh, there's still Stradivarius had guitars, uh, had violins hanging. He actually built a few guitars. They were in uh, Vermilion, South Dakota. But, and they look like some of the guitars we make today. But he'd, he'd, you know, he'd have violins hanging in the foyer and his wife would complain. He married at 55 a second time had a son who was a giant fuck up, who was the party boy, he went to Florence and never came home. So he was the guy who wanted to make violins, his other son had to be the violin maker. You know, so their lives really weren't much different. When I really understood that, I saw, and, you know, and we really, we work really hard to do this. We do it because we love it. I don't know anybody 
with the exception of maybe Bob Taylor who does this to make money. Most of us do it because we really feel we should be doing it or some reason we fabricated and convinced ourselves to, to do But It's kind of a sacred practice for many of us and, uh, and why am I getting off into this tangent? Because it's fascinating. Because it's important. I mean, it's why I get up every day and, you know, I do this. It's, it's a really beautiful thing to do. But anyway, gluing the fingerboard on flat is simple. Most of these tools are very simple. You can run that guy again. Tom, specifically why fish glue? Uh, well, because hide glue is the material that's of most trades because it's easy to disassemble. But hide glue is so uh, uh, subject to wind, like if a breeze blows through, you can be screwed. You know, if something goes wrong, if there's any contamination in it. So somebody turned me on recently to fish glue, a violin maker, Andy Carruthers, and uh, his violins are, and cellos are incredible. And uh, in that world, although the violin makers think of us as being the sort of the poor stepchildren, uh, the, um, you know, the our guitars are are uh, seeking legitimacy in the sense of the violins and we've come a long way in my lifetime. Uh, but um, you've got to think back that when I started making guitars at 20, actually at 18 years old, there were, there weren't major programs in universities for, now they're, they're, you can graduate from almost any, any major university with a guitar degree, you know. And that says a lot about legitimacy of this instrument in our culture. And when I was in Washington testifying for the Lacey stuff, talking to the senators and Congress people, I would say to them stuff like, well, when they would say, well, you guys are criminals for using this wood, I would say to them, well, did not your daughter dance at, at, at her wedding or your son to guitar music? You know, do, do you not have guitar riffs stuck in your head? And they go, yeah. And I'd go, I rest my case. Of course we're not criminals, you know. Uh, you know, we, we, the guitar has, tri has contributed to the culture of our life, just as the music has. It's been a big part of most of our generation because a lot of us are, I don't see a lot of people in their early 20s here. There's a few, uh, you know. But, um, and for those people who work for me, so there was Timmy in the back, and, and uh, I don't know if Frankie's here, but who are younger people, they, they brought the same passion that I brought to this. Uh, you know, they wouldn't be making the guitars they are. Uh, they not brought that. If I can teach them how to do one thing, it's how to bring their A game to this thing every day. You, know, so you got to. Uh, but anyway, you can roll the thing. Oh, and why fish glue particularly? Uh, fish glue is great. It's uh, not subjected to, uh, you know, I, I use it in all temperatures. When it gets a little thin, you can re, uh, using a little distilled water, you can actually rehydrate it. It has great working time. It's tremendous. It's easy to disassemble. You know, I haven't had 50 years experience with it, but you know, when it comes to making parts that I need to disassemble, you know, for other repair people, I find it to be so much less temperamental than high glue. And this is sort of what swept through the violin world. And I guess so some veneer guys use it too. It's uh, so not. You use it hot? No, it's uh, it's a. You don't have to heat it up. Oh. It's there's a little canister of it over there that uh, if, Bobby, you that thing with the red cap right behind you. So does it this, shatter yeah. like high glue, Tom? It, it will shatter. It behaves very much like high glue. You really have to impact it highly. But this is, uh, this is fish glue. And uh, yes. I'll try not to pour it on my feet, but you can see that it's pretty thin. It's, you know, it's actually very stable. And it's not temperature sensitive. So, you know, I can heat, I heat it up a little bit when I use it just to get it to flow a little better. But I don't have to have that nervous, constant anxiety of, you know, I got two seconds and maybe a breeze. I mean, I, literally, I've seen this ruined neck joints when the, somebody opens the window, open, comes in the door, you can, a high glue can go bang like that and just be no good. So what's the, the physics of it? What? What's the I'll, physics of it? Very much like high glue. Chemistry. Very much like high glue. Same kind of thing. It's a, it's a cold water fish glue. Um, but it behaves very much like the same way that hide glue does. So this is, I think, why the violin makers have accepted that. You couldn't find a, pardon me if there are any violin makers here, they're a pretty stodgy group of people, and they're very slow to make changes. When these guys decide something's working, I'm going to go with it, you know. Uh, so for me, I've got to measure my life in you know, 10, 15 more, 20 more years or something, so I, I'm not going to screw around waiting 10 years to see if it works now at this point. You're welcome to open this and take a look at it. It also doesn't, um, there are mo multiple varieties of this. This stuff's about $100 for this much of it. However, it, I've had this for a year, and um, it, it's the other versions of fish glue, if you're not careful, some fish glues are extremely toxic. They have uh, some formaldehyde in them, things like this. So there's a big uh, paint someplace over there where I spilled some, ate the paint right off the floor. This stuff is completely uh, easy to deal with. And so I pay more for it better, and I don't use it for everything. I use it for those selective things. Working time is the same as high glue, so you probably have I have a good 45 minutes to really push things around, and it has the same feel as high glue, the same sort of slimy feel. Uh, so I've, so far, my, the jury is, you know, not completely in, but I'm really happy with what I've been doing with it, you know. And you thin it with? Water. Uh, distilled water. Oh, wow. Pure distilled water, and I'm uh, very careful about that, too. 
But it's great because when the stuff thickens up, you can redux it again a little bit, and it comes back to life, and it's been great. Is that, Tom, isn't that what they used to chip glue or um, chip glass, the glue? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh, that's what I thought. Yeah, in fact, I think Frank uh, Ford did a bit of a study of that and published it on frets.com about gluing things to glass and breaking glass with mm -hmm. hard glues. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, uh, I like a transparent adhesive. A crazy glue actually can be a very transparent acoustic adhesive as well, you know, depending on how you use it. All these adhesives have their great value to me, and they're all different, and they have different special purposes. You know, when I was younger, I glue everything together with Tide Bond. You know, now I'm more focused on, and Tide Bond's great. Now, I don't use Tide Bond 2, I don't use Tide Bond New, I use Tide Bond 1. I love, to, I told my people who work for me who teach, I tell them, you know, Tide Bond is, is uh, you can tell a good Tide Bond if you, if you sniff it, you know, open the bottle, see if it has a sour smell, take it out, do this with it. If it curves a little bit to your fingers, it's old, or it's been frozen. So I, have my, I sent my uh, big tall Stuart when he was working here into, into a Garrett Hardware to get a new bottle. I never buy huge bottles of Tide Bond because the stuff degrades over time. He's in there opening it and sniffing it and doing this and they came. They, had, they wanted to escort him out because they thought he was sniffing glue. <laughs> so I, I'm telling this to everybody because I, I love to do this at Ace Hardware. But you know, you open the different bottles, if you, you can smell bad Tide Bond. It's, it's sour, you know. Yeah. So it's just, it's tough. You know, we're going to break to have you play. Do you want to? Whatever let's you want to play do, go ahead. Here. Don't um, bound headstock, and this is the lamination we were talking about. We've just done the binding, so you can see we haven't scraped it. Putting the frets in here, they're just driven in. Pound, 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 pound. This really isn't a video that teaches you how to make a guitar. It's more about the story of this one. Uh, and then we're filing the frets individually, holding them in a hand screw. I find it interesting that a lot of younger people have never even seen a hand screw. Uh, you know, I love these things. I've had them since I was 20. So we filed the bevel to fret ends here, uh, and not quite here, but the, well, well, each individual fret has to be shaped, rounded, polished through multiple levels of, of paper. I go, I go up to 12,000 grit on frets, so they're like ice skating. They should be like uh, 24 joules on the ends of them. And uh, one of the big things that's so challenging with fret, fret work is a signature for makers. You can see the neck joint, big tenon cut in here now. And, uh, you can also see the angle with which it exists on because of all that weird geometry. So some of this is a truss rod. Somebody was asking about the nature of the truss rod. This is what the more modern truss rods look like. This is the neck joint, which is a big tenon. I cut that on this router table. When I flipped that up, there's a jig under there, router cut. And then the fitting of the neck, which takes about six to eight hours to fit everything exactly right. So I've got to fit this fascia. I've got to fit this fascia. And I've got to have it project out so when there's a straight edge on it, it's uh, exactly within tolerance of where the bridge will be to within a, you know, maybe a few thousandths. So this is an ordeal to fit a neck on a guitar in a traditional way and then glue it on. In this case, I bolted the neck on and I'm going to glue it because it's got a big tenon. When, now I'm going to glue it because at first this thing was so radical. What I told Jack is I'll make this so that no matter what happens, we'll be able to make it work. So fitting this is done with a compass and a scribe, just like you fit a cabinet, you know, and uh, but it's an ordeal, so I figure six six hour budget for getting a neck on a guitar. And there are times when I just get tired uh, of it. This is what the heel cap and the ebony detail works on the back of the neck. And uh, this miter was cut by Jordy back there, my mom and dad. Uh, this is that beautiful, the beautiful lines of these things. They're so feminine. This particular instrument has taken on a life of its own. Uh, this this is such a deeply personal thing for Jack yeah, that. I feel this in my gut when I'm working on this instrument. In fact, Jordy said to me one day, I feel like I'm not alone in the shop. It feels like the guitar is inhabited by the spirit. This is a picture I took one night of this. And then um, it, it's so cartoon-like that this is like a happy, smiling Jack's, you know, I sent this picture to Jack and it, he went nuts. It was just the most beautiful thing. So this project is very deep. It's not your average guitar. And I thought from the perspective of doing something really just cool and different, it would be a good thing to talk about because it involves responding to the clients, getting paid for it, you know, dealing with all of this. You know, every time you try to do something new, it's a huge challenge. And so this will give birth to a whole other group of instruments. We'll have another series of these following behind in the same design, somewhat modified. Now I'm working on the third part of a trio, which involves this technology. Mike's actually making the side unit now, uh, and the RGC guys are working with me on this thing. And um, It'll be a smaller version of that bass in quilted mahogany and be a part of a three trio. That's right in the middle of we're right in the middle of working on that now. And so this instrument 
and what we've done is to create uh, a whole new family of instruments from it. And uh, you know, so very exciting. You know, for uh, the worst thing you can do for a guy like me who doesn't make a lot of anything well, uh, you know, uh, the best thing you can do is the worst thing you can do is succeed with a design because then you got to make it over and over and over again. And and, it, it, it's, when I saw the size, it sort of impressed upon me like the guitar on so the, uh, Mexican music. Yeah. You know that that you know whenever Deep. I saw first time I saw a mariachi band, I was like, wow, their guitars are huge. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's part of the, the reason why this is so deep, because mm -hmm. mariachi, the guitaron, which is the bass, right. is, you know, usually deep and has a certain sound. What Jack wanted was, he was a big fan of jazz, believe it or not, and he used to go listen to, to Charlie Mingus when he was in D.C., a kid growing up. He's been playing with Yarmouth since he was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. They're still playing together, but his, he used to go watch Eric Dolphy, and his, he loves jazz. He's very much into that kind of tone. That's what he wanted me to do. And, you know, what Bobby plays is a whole nother iteration that's like I say another generation of instrument of playing after after Jack and Jack was very clear with me that I can't play like Bobby but I play like I play so I need an instrument that actually kind of is a simpler bass thing you know you're, you're kind of the racing car driver for the whole halfling thing because he's driven these instruments from the beginning and if you build an instrument that's different it's going to behave differently so the players really respond to it differently if anybody takes you seriously in my world and you build something different you've been very very uh, happy to have that happen because uh, guitar world is one of uh, a lot of cultural impetus you know when you do something different you become kind of an idiot people look at you in a way like they think you're crazy but I felt like um, this is what I wanted to do so I did it the sun comes up and the sun goes down work away Grab a little shot, I can do it all again. The sun comes up and the sun goes.